So we have a point x, y, right? We uh, change the point by adding delta x, delta y. We get a new point over here, okay? And then this change in uh, delta z, okay, is actually this change along the curve. Okay, I hope you can see that because what I'm actually doing is that I'm applying the function to the new point. I'm subtracting, subtracting that um, by the old point. So it'll give me the difference of the points uh, that varies as I travel along the surface. Okay, which, which, you know, if I travel along the surface uh, in accordance to this line, I'm traveling along the curve. So this point is actually, the, okay, the value of z over here is the same as the value of z over there. So um, delta z, okay, or sorry, I should maybe say a triangle z, okay, triangle z. Okay, delta z, delta z is better. I'll use dz for this. Delta z is given by the change over here as I travel along the surface. Now, what is dz giving me? Notice that I say it's a linear function because really x and y are basically, you know, just uh, linear terms. Okay, x and y, delta x, delta y are linear terms um, of delta x and delta y. Okay? And because they're linear terms, notice that really this a and b describes the gradient as I travel along delta x and delta y. Okay, delta x is over here, multiplied by a certain gradient, I will go um, up. Um, I've seen, I'll mu multiply by a certain gradient, I'll, get, I'll move up along the z-axis over there, and I'll do the same for y. So basically, as I move along this line, from this point to this point, I'm actually moving um, along a straight line, okay, because of the linear functions, and that straight line is really increasing in z value, okay, and that would give me um, dz. Okay, now you will notice that these two values are different, okay, are different. There's a small allowance for that over there. This allowance is actually given by this epsilon delta x and epsilon delta y, okay. And lastly, if this delta x and delta y is to be made sufficiently small, okay, I can say that the delta z is actually approximately equals to dz. Now, why is that so? It comes from these conditions over here. You see, if I were to make x and y sufficiently small, x and y actually tends towards zero. And if I were to just substitute zero inside this epsilon one, epsilon two, they actually cancel out. And I know that the delta z is given by the total differential of dz. Okay, but I will still have these small values of delta x and delta y for me to be put inside here. Okay, technically speaking, what I'm trying to say is that I'm reducing the percentage error of epsilon 1, epsilon 2 if I were to substitute 0 inside here. Okay, I want to substitute 0 inside there because really I want to find an easier method to calculate the, the change delta z. Okay, and that is given by the total differential dz, okay, which is the linear functions in terms of delta x and delta y. But obviously the problem now is finding a and b, which I'll do so in due course. So, this is what we call the total differential. Total differential is really means two things. In general, it means when the function um, delta z can be expressed in this form over here. Like I show you, this explicit example really shows that it can, it can express in this form. If it's expressed in this form, we say that it has a total differential at the point x, y. And the total differential is also another term, dz is equals to a uh, delta x plus b delta y. And delta z is approximately equals to zz when delta x and delta y are made sufficiently small because it will reduce the percentage error by substituting zero inside epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Okay, so yes, very difficult, very difficult to understand, but we need to really, you know, get into this language of our advanced differential calculus. Thank you.